wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-karim Allahumma salli ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ali sayyidina Muhammad wa barik wa sallim Before we uh, begin today's class some announcements and that is that our class is soon going to be coming to an end probably another four lectures or so today we'll complete Ya'juj and Ma'juj inshallah and from the next class we want to go through the whole surah like uh, ayah by ayah the traditional way so you'll have to bring your copies of your Quran with you from next week inshallah for the first time, I want to give you an assignment. <coughs> I'm hoping that out of these lectures and classes that I'm conducting, will emerge at least part of the leadership of the Muslim community for tomorrow. The thinkers, the scholars and the thinkers, who tomorrow will provide guidance for this Muslim community. At least some of them will come out, emerge out of these classes and lectures. So we're planting very important seeds here. <coughs> the assignment I have for you is, I'd like you, at your leisure, to write for me an essay on the subject <coughs> excuse me, of Surah Tulkaf in the modern age. Does Surah Tulkaf explain the modern age? If it does, what is that explanation? <coughs> Go to my book, uh, Jerusalem in the Quran, and see the method that I use. Whenever I quote a verse of the Quran, I put it in a separate, separate text. Hmm? And at the bottom, on the right hand corner, I'll put the name of the surah and the number of the surah and then the number of the ayah. So use that method. Secondly, whenever I quote a hadith, I'll put it separate from the text. And then at the bottom of the hadith on the right hand corner, we'll put Bukhari or Muslim, Abu Dawood, whatever it is. If you're using a computer, well then it's very easy to do that. And you have the CDs, with the Quran and with the Ahadith, which I have, then it's very easy. If you're using your pen, you might want to use a different color ink for verses of the Quran and for Ahadith. All right? Uh, there's no link to the amount of pages. It's up to you uh, for writing that essay. Um, take your time. And whenever you finish with it, then you can give it to me, if you wish to. It's not obligatory. When we complete the last lecture, which should be about four weeks from now, then I would like to give you about a month, or a little bit more than a month, in which to revise, and then invite those who would like to take the test to come and take a test hmm? in which you will now not have anything helping you. You can't use my Jerusalem in the Quran. <laughs> you can't use your notes and so on. And we'll be testing you to see how much you have retained and how much are you thinking on the subject. So if you are interested in writing the test, then of course uh, you can come and do the, the test. It is from that examination, plus the essays that you're going to write, that I'll be able to make an assessment of if there is anyone or how many there are amongst you who have been able to grasp what has been taught. Hmm? All right. <coughs> so remember to bring your Quran from next week, inshallah. We begin with Allah's blessed name. 
We praise him and we glorify him as he ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. Today we have the last class, we will conclude the subject of Ya'juj and Ma'juj or Gog and Magog. Now this Sunday, next Sunday, we'll have this topic as a lecture, the Ansari Memorial Series. Did you get the flyers? Uh, Wahid? We have flyers? Okay. Uh, so when you come to attend that lecture, you get in an hour and a half a summary of a few hours of lecturing that we had in this class on the subject of Gog and Magog. In the last lecture, we attempted to identify Gog and Magog. <coughs> and we found that the original Gog and Magog were located the Caucasus Mountains. We identified them with a tribe or two tribes who had an inexplicable power that the Muslim army had attacked and defeated simultaneously the two superpowers in the world at that time. Who were they? The two superpowers? The Persian and the Byzantine Empire, not Roman. And defeated both of them. And the Muslim army had emerged as the superpower. Uh, the superpower in the world, unrivaled. And yet this Muslim army confronted a a force more powerful in it when it attempted to pass through the Caucasus Mountains to attack Europe. And that force was the Khaza tribes. K-H-A-Z-A-R. Confirming that here was a power that was more powerful than the Muslim army. Then we found that this Khaza tribe converted to Judaism, became Jews. So white people, European people now become Jews. And these Khazar people are the ones who then spread out over Europe, first Eastern Europe and then Western Europe. And these European Jews were at the very heart of the transformation of Europe. We see them at work in the French Revolution. We see them at work in the Bolshevik Revolution, 1917. And then we saw them at work across the sea in America, transforming the United States of America, the white man who is a Jew. Then we saw them establishing the Zionist movement and then waging what I call a pig-headed effort to establish the state of Israel and then to cause that Israel to become the ruling state in the world. So we identified Gog and Magog not just in Western civilization, not just in European civilization, we did it, we, we were more refined in our uh, identification. We went to a particular part of Europe and we located it in the Khaza tribes. Now, I said there was one book on the subject. What is the title of the book? The 13th tribe by a man whose name was Kersler or something like that. Did anyone find it? No? Well, keep trying. It's, it is on the internet. The 13th tribe is on the internet. Just look around some websites for the 13th tribe, okay? Having identified Gog and Magog in a particular part of Europe, oh, here we are. Here we are. He found it. SHA found it. 
the name of the author, write it down. Is Arthur, A-R-T-H-U-R, Kersler, K-O-E-S-T, K-O-E-S-T-L-E-R. website now. The first one. Okay. But there's now been WW Day. Okay. Oh go to Google search. Google.com and type in the 13 tribe. Hmm? If you have the internet access, go to Google and then type in, in the search search engine the 13 tribe and you'll get it. We have a uh, a hadith in which the Prophet said Sallallahu Ta'ala Alaihi Wasallam that when Gog and Magog are released the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee and start to drink the water and by the time the last of them pass by the Sea of Galilee they will say there used to be water here this hadith is found in Sahih Muslim. You'll also find it in Jerusalem in the Quran, in the chapter on Gog and Magog. Okay? But we know that Gog and Magog are going to be finally destroyed in Jerusalem. The Sea of Galilee is north of Jerusalem. And therefore, Gog and Magog are coming from the north. Okay? When Zulkarnain made his two journeys, the Quran said the first journey was towards the Maghrib Shams, where the sun is setting. That's west. And the second journey was Matla Shams, Matla Shams, where the sun was rising, so east. But the Quran does not give us the direction of the third journey. And I said to you at that time, it is possible for us to be able to determine that the third journey was towards the north. But I didn't give you the evidence. Here's the evidence. Hmm? They passed by the Sea of Galilee. And their destination is Jerusalem where they will be destroyed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which we'll do in a moment here. So if, if the Sea of Galilee is north of Jerusalem, the implication is that Gog and Magog are coming from the north. Hmm? So the third journey of Zulkarnain had to be north, which is of course the Caucasus Mountains. All right. The evidence is now here. Incontrovertible evidence, unchallengeable evidence that the Sea of Galilee is now lower than it has ever been in all of history. The rains come and winter come and so on and the water level changes, but <coughs> insignificant changes in water level. The hard fact is that the water level in the Sea of Galilee is now lower than it has ever been in all of history. Implying that the hadith of the Prophet is now being fulfilled. 
that Gog and Magog have been passing by the Sea of Galilee. If Gog and Magog have been passing by the Sea of Galilee and drinking the water, implying consuming the water, can we identify them? Hmm? Who is responsible for this excessive consumption of water in the Sea of Galilee? Can it be Egypt? No. Can it be Syria? No. <coughs> Can it be Lebanon? No. None of these countries utilize water from the Sea of Galilee. Only two countries. Number one, Jordan. And number two, Israel. Is Jordan responsible for this excessive consumption of water from the Sea of Galilee? No. Because the Sea of Galilee is under Israeli control now. After the 1967 war. Prior to 67, the Sea of Galilee was under Syrian control. But after, after Israel took the Golan Heights, then the Sea of Galilee entered into Israeli control. In, 19, <coughs> in the 1990s, maybe 94, 95, 96, somewhere around there, Israel and Jordan signed a peace treaty, you remember? And one of the articles of that peace treaty between Israel and Jordan, bringing hostilities to a close, was that Israel contracted to give to Jordan a certain amount of water from the Sea of Galilee. So Israel has determined how much water can go to Jordan. And so Jordan cannot be the answer to the question. The question is, who is responsible for this excessive consumption of water from the Sea of Galilee? That you're taking out more than nature can put back in or nature can replenish. Well, in order for us to answer the question, who is taking it out? Let us ask, why is it being taken out? What is it being used for? Not domestic agriculture. Agriculture is using the same amount of water. Well then, where is the water going? Domestic consumption has risen. The amount of people, the amount of water you now take to make your wudu, the amount of water you now take to make your bosu huh, has risen dramatically. The amount of water you take to wash your hand, the amount of water you take to wash your clothes, all of this is dra rising dramatically, but this domestic consumption does not explain. Well then where is the water going? Can anyone guess? Yes? That's a minute amount of water. Yes, but that does not explain the micro uh, chip technology, the nuclear reactor reactors and so on form part of a bigger hole. The bigger hole is the scientific and industrial economy. The driver of a Nissan 280C. So number one, the industrial economy and the scientific and technological industry is attached to it. That's where the water is going. Modern industry is the thirstiest of all in history. The second source of the utilization of water is a project embarked upon by the State of Israel 
to transform the deserts, to make the deserts green. If you want to make the desert green, you're actually changing nature. So you're going to be utili utilizing a massive amount of water. Okay. Who is responsible for instituting or establishing these policies? The industrial economy in Israel and the policy of making the deserts green. Is it the whole of Israel? Israel comprises two people. Number one, the European Jew who has no racial lineage with Ibrahim alayhi salam. No. He's a Johnny come lately Jew. He just converted to Judaism yesterday. And then you have the actual Banu Israel who lived in Yemen, in Iraq, in Egypt and so on, in Morocco. <coughs> These are racially close to the Arabs. These are the Oriental Jews. And they are known in Israel as Sephardim. Sephardim or the Sephardic Jews. But the others who came from Europe, they are known as the Ashkenazi. Ashkenazi. The state of Israel was established by the Ashkenazi. The Ashkenazi or the European Jew has controlled power in the state of Israel from day one. The government of Israel was comprised of Ashkenazi Jews, white people. So Israel has been effectively a European state. And so the answer to the question, who is utilized, who drink in the water? It is not Banu Israel or the Jews who came from Yemen and from Morocco and from Iraq. Not them, but rather the European Jews. And so the Oriental Jews are not Gog and Magog. The Oriental Jews were the one who said, we've killed him. There he is, we've killed him. The Messiah, the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, these are the Oriental Jews. And they are not Gog and Magog. But the European Jews, who are in control of Israel from day one, within their ranks you will find Gog and Magog. So we are now able to refine our definition and provide more evidence to support the conclusion to which we've arrived. Now then, <coughs> if the contemporary world order, the meaning of a world order is the possession of power with which to be able to control the world, to establish what may be called Pax Americana or Pax Britannica or the one that's coming up tomorrow, Pax Judaica, a world order. The implications now of our recognition of today's world order as the world order of Gog and Magog. I'm not the first to come to that conclusion. No, there were others before me. But we've been very few. Very few. Is this world order the world order of Gog and Magog? Why is it that the overwhelming majority of the scholars of Islam reject this position of ours? Because of a hadith. One solitary hadith. It is in Sahih Muslim. This is what the hadith says. And you find it in Jerusalem in the Quran in the chapter. 
The hadith says that Nabi Isa Islam will come down and that he will then kill Dajjal and after Dajjal has been killed <coughs> Allah will then say to Nabi Isa Islam go up the mountain which is a mountain in Baytul Maqdis, Jerusalem go up the mountain why? I have created creatures of mine so powerful that none but I can destroy them. And then Gog and Magog are released and the first of them will pass by the Sea of Galilee and start to drink the water. And by the time the last of them pass, they will say there used to be water here. This hadith in Sahih Muslim very clearly, very clearly implies that the release of Gog and Magog will take place only after Dajjal has been killed. Hmm? <coughs> it is really amazing that the overwhelming number of our scholars have chosen to hold on to this one solitary hadith and use this as the foundation for the establishment of their thought on the subject. In the process of holding on to this one solitary hadith, they are now waiting for Gog and Magog. That only after Nabi Isa al-Islam returns, after Dajjal has been killed, only then will Allah bring down the barrier. Only then will Gog and Magog be released. And so we do not have Gog and Magog in the world anyway now. Maulana Fadl Rahman Ansari, Rahimahullah, our teacher, warned. This was his warning. He said, do not study any verse of the Quran or any hadith in isolation. No. He said, bring all the material together. Do you remember? This is one of the earlier lectures. Bring all the verses of the Quran on a subject. Bring all the hadiths on the subject. <coughs> Bring all the relevant material that you have on a the subject. Then study that material and try to locate the thread which binds it together into a meaningful whole. What was that thread that he called it? He called it the system of meaning. These are Maulana's words. When you have located that system of meaning which binds the material together as a harmonious whole, then go and study the hadith you want to study. Hmm? Today's Islamic scholarship has not done that. If you took all of the material together, then you could never be able to fit in this hadith. This hadith stands out in conflict with all the rest of the material. So in the process of holding on to that solitary isolated hadith, in Sahih Muslim, they have disregarded it, it a hadith in Sahih Bukhari, in which the Prophet Islam, clearly confirmed that the wall was brought down in his lifetime. That Gog and Magog were released in his lifetime. Eight ahadis in Sahih Bukhari. Well, what can I do if they want to wait? So go ahead and wait. But there is one hadith which stands in the way now for them. It is in Sahih Bukhari. And Allah says,
Latuhajjannal bait Layuhajjannal bait Walayu'tamaranna The people will continue To make the hajj To the house of Allah And people will continue To perform the umrah To the house of Allah The Kaaba <coughs> Ba'da khuruj ya'juj wa ma'juj Even after Gog and Magog have been released And then the hadith goes on to say La taqumu sa'atu hatta la yuhajja That the last day would not come until the hajj has been abandoned This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari Let me repeat it People will continue to perform the Hajj and the Umrah even after the release of Gog and Magog. But the last day would not come until the Hajj has been abandoned. And so when that day comes that the Hajj is abandoned, it will confirm <laughs> that Gog and Magog were released long ago. Are you following me? Well, I am anticipating that the abandonment of the Hajj will take place. All right, let me ask you, when? When do you presume that the Hajj will be abandoned? Let me see if any of the sisters have an answer. Good to hear you now. Said the Prophet ﷺ, What do you think will cause the abandonment of the Hajj? My wife could also answer the question. Yes? When Dajjal rules. Mm -hmm. All right. Anybody else? I like that answer. Anybody else? If they are blocked from going, if they are blocked from going. Prohibited from going, yes. What event is likely to take place? Which will cause the abandonment of the Hajj? Huh? The big war, correct. When Israel wages her big war, which will witness the dramatic territorial expansion of the state, and then a concomitant. Concomitant means taking place at the same time. A concomitant attack on the US dollar, and it collapses. And all the paper money in the world collapse. And the US economy collapses. And then Israel replaces the United States as the ruling state in the world. That big war is likely to inflame the passions of the Muslims around the world to such a fever pitch that the Saudi government cannot allow the Hajj to take place because such a Hajj would likely threaten the foundations of the Saudi state. And so they might use some cock and bull story about some virus which is a great danger to health and so and get World Health Organization to issue an advisory so, and then they suspend the Hajj. And then the next year they continue the suspension until eventually the Hajj is abandoned. Hmm? And so this event could be around the corner. The abandonment of the Hajj which has been, which has been held for the last few thousand years. Israel is likely to wage a big war, I said, probably within the next five to ten years. And then the Hajj is abandoned. What are the scholars of Islam going to do at that time? Hmm? You cannot say 
that we have to wait for the return of Nabi Isa alayhi salam and for him to kill Dajjal only then for Gog and Magog and to be released because here is the hadith. People will continue to perform the Hajj and the Umrah even after the release of Gog and Magog. But the last hour would not come until the Hajj is abandoned and that is around the corner in my opinion. Now then, <coughs> if we are to accept the position given in this class that the world order which today controls the world in its iron grip, and you must read this flyer, please get one copy of this flyer before you leave. Is the world order of Gog and Magog, what are the implications for us? Number one, that the power of those who control the world today in their wicked grip cannot be defeated and destroyed. And so our incapacity to challenge them does not invalidate the claim to truth of Islam. Let me repeat that. Our incapacity to successfully challenge those who control the world today with their indestructible power, our incapacity to successfully challenge them does not invalidate Islam's claim to truth. <laughs> Why? Because Allah has created this power. <coughs> it is evil. Oh yes, it is evil. But did Allah not say at the end of the Quran, Kul a'uzu bi rabbil falak? And then, what after that? Min sharri ma khalaq. Say, I seek refuge with Allah, the Rabb of the Falak, the dawn, from the evil which he created. He did not create Iblis as an evil being, did he? <coughs> no. Iblis made a choice. As we all make our choices, sometimes we choose and then we regret our choice. Hmm? Iblis made his choice to disobey. So Iblis was not created as an evil being. Evil has come to him through his own choice. Allah asked him, why did you not bow down when I commanded you to bow? Come on Iblis, answer me. And he answered, he said, Ana khayru minhu. I better than he. Khalaktani min nar, you created me from fire. Wa khalaktahu min teen, and you created him from clay. And therefore, I am superior to him. So why I, I bow into him? So Iblis is not an evil being created by Allah as an evil being. Well then where is the evil that Allah created? Gog and Magog, <laughs> clearly, are evil beings created by Allah. Dajjal, an evil being created by Allah. But notice that all the evil beings created by Allah are destroyed by Allah. He will destroy Gog and Magog. And his messenger, Nabi Isa Islam, will destroy Dajjal. What are the implications, therefore, for jihad? Jihad, in its asghar, lesser form, is war, fighting, a holy war. And in its greater form, jihad, al-akbar, is the internal struggle. The lesser form, which is fighting, is also called kital. Kital fight. Can we wage war against those who control the world today? Can we successfully 
waged jihad against the United States of America or against Britain. If you do not have Surah al -Kaf, you might come to a different answer. But when you have Surah al -Kaf, you know that no combination of rivals in the world today, none, can successfully challenge the power of those who today control the world. So you cannot wage jihad against them. What you can do <coughs> is a political come guerrilla war, which is going on in Iraq now. Like uh, Muqtadir al with his 1,000 men or so, have gone into Najaf. And in Najaf is the shrine of Sayyidina Imam Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu. It is the holiest place in the world for the Shia. The United States of America has the power to go in and attack them and liquidate them easily. But the United States has not been able to do that for a whole month now. Why? Because the political implications of sending in troops into the heart of Najaf and fighting these people in the masjid would be enormous and the United States cannot risk. So this is not the normal jihad, this is the political come guerrilla struggle. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and so all of our revolutionary Islamic movements, including those in Trinidad, who believe that you can wage a successful armed struggle against those who are attacking Muslims today around the world and who attempt sometimes to take over this country <laughs> as they did in 1990 are people without adequate knowledge of the subject. Does that mean that jihad is now a thing of the past? That we can no longer wage a struggle, an armed struggle anywhere in the world? No, the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, that there will always be in my ummah those who will continue jihad until the last day, never stop it. And he mentioned the tribe of Tamimi as one of them. <coughs> the implication for us is that while it is impossible for us to wage jihad, an armed struggle, Anywhere in the world today, there is one part of the world where on the basis of a prophecy of the Prophet himself وسلم, an armed struggle has the guarantee of success. And that is the struggle to liberate the Holy Land. And since he said that the army is going to come from huh? Khurasan, it means that the entire pathway from Khorasan to Jerusalem, that entire geographical stretch, is the battleground of jihad. Iraq stands in the middle. <laughs> Afghanistan stands in the middle. All the way from Khorasan to Jerusalem. That jihad has already started. And that jihad has a guarantee of success. But nowhere else in the world, you cannot liberate Kashmir with an armed struggle. Can you go and tell that to the Kashmiri Mujahideen? They have not studied Surat al -Kath. Go and tell that to Chechenia. Go and tell that to the Muslims in the south of Thailand, Patani. About a hundred and something were just killed the last week. Go and tell that to the Muslims in the south of the Philippines, Mindanao. They're waging an armed struggle for a long, long time now. Go and tell that to the Muslims in Aceh, in the north of Sumatra, of Indonesia. The Indonesian army is out there butchering Muslims for the last one year. Hmm? You cannot wage an armed struggle today, anywhere in the world, 
and succeed, except the armed struggle which commences from Khorasan and will culminate in the liberation of the Holy Land. That is one of the amazing implications of our recognition of today's world order as the world order of Gog and Magog. What else can we do <coughs> when we realize that this is the implications for jihad? The other implication for us is that once Gog and Magog are released, they corrupt everything, including morals. And so your teenage daughter, you going to the masjid five times a day, huh? You ensure only halal meat in your house. But your teenage daughter in a place called Pier One, is it? Is that what they call it? Somewhere in Chagarama, is it? And that with that, the parties? Yeah. Your teenage daughter gone partying in Pier One? Is this a common phenomenon? Is it happening? And Dr. Wahid Ali spent about two hours this morning with me, hammering me. What are you doing, Imran? This is happening in the country. This is happening in our community. What are you doing about it? Hmm? How do we respond to a world which is becoming more and more corrupt, more and more decadent, more and more vulgar? And you know that you cannot change it. What do you do when you see the ship sinking and you know you cannot prevent it from sinking? Come on, somebody. Huh? You don't have to have a law degree like Imran to answer the question. When you see the ship sinking, and you know you cannot prevent it from sinking. Let me see what the sisters will say. <laughs> the ship is sinking. You cannot prevent it from sinking. What do you do? Wait. Correct. Correct. Get off the ship. That's the correct answer. Get off the ship. Allah says, Ku anfusakum wa ahlikum nara. Protect yourselves and protect your families from the fire. Every Muslim home has been touched by the fire already. This one, your sister married some Bhagwan Singh. And that one, his sister married some Mr. Thomas. Eh? And now when you even tell them, Salam Walaikum, they don't want to answer Walaikum Salam. S.H.E. -E shake in your head. And when you go in the kitchen, you might find some pork in the kitchen. Eh? That's our community today. And when you look at the newspapers for the people who die, and all the family members, and he's a Muslim fella, but the funeral service in Rose Heart Presbyterian Church or something. <laughs> eh? The funeral service, or oh, you go on cre crematorium. <laughs> and if you see the names, look at the names of all the family members, and you see it's a pillow. Is a pillow. <coughs> the Quran has commanded protect yourselves and protect your families from the fire. The evidence is as plain as daylight, not only for this community, that we are losing. We are losing. What do we do? She said, if you on board a ship, and the ship's sinking, and you know it's sinking, and you can't stop it from sinking, you get off the ship. That's what the sister said. And that's what Surah Tulkaf says. 
That is precisely what Surah al kaf said. Get off the ship means go and search for an area of greater security where you can establish yourselves and have some confidence that your families are protected from the fire. That is the project of the Muslim village. We're not creating a Muslim village just for Papi Show. We're creating a Muslim village out of a recognition that the world out there is not only corrupted, but becoming increasingly corrupted. And that there's a tomorrow which is coming when they'll not be just simulating sexual intercourse, they'll be having the real thing out there in public, like donkeys. And so you withdraw from the godless, decadent world. You withdraw. But you withdraw in such a way that you're able to gently reach out to others and invite them to come. You're not withdrawing by hurling curses upon them. This lecture, inshallah, will be in July, the Muslim village. When the lecture is delivered in July, we'll have a, a, a booklet to distribute. And at that time, the project will be established. We already have a number of people who've been invited <coughs> to take charge of the project. And then we'll invite people to invest $20,000 for a plot of land. This is a down payment. The actual final cost of the land should be something like what NHA is doing, five, six dollars a square foot. So you'll be paying between 20 and 30,000 for a plot of land. You're getting more than one lot. That's all. Hmm? We'll have to buy the land, we'll have to develop it, and then we we'll know the final cost. You're not going to get a thousand acres in Trinidad. You're going to have to settle for 100 acres here, and 100 acres there, and 100 acres there. So maybe 100 families here, 100 families there, 100 small villages scattered all over the island. But in this village, we have to establish Islam so that people can come and see this is Islam. Only then can we protect our people from that corrupted world out there, which is already destroying this community. Now, <coughs> what is the end of Gog and Magog? And why has Allah created two of them, not one? Two tribes. Hmm? Let's take the second question first. Dajjal is one being. But Gog and Magog are two sets of people. They behave the same way. They are linked to each other racially. They are different from all the rest of mankind. Why are they two? Incidentally, there is a website on the Ashkenazi Jew. And in that website, you will find medical evidence. There was a medical conference which was held on the Ashkenazi. And the evidence was produced in that conference that the Ashkenazi Jew is genetically different from all other human beings. He is a unique phenomenon in history, <laughs> the Ashkenazi Jew. <coughs> Why are they two? Answer, Dajjal is an individual operating in the unseen world. So Dajjal needs his foot soldiers. Gog and Magog are his foot soldiers. Gog, his right hand, and Magog, his left hand. Why does he need two? Because this is part of his strategy, his method through which he deceives. He offers you an alternative of George Bush or what is the name for him? Kerry? 
what Kerry? John Kerry? Ah. You have a choice between George Bush, who is the devil personified, and John Kerry, who is presented to look like an angel. And so eight million Muslims in North America will now all go and march to the polls and vote for John Kerry, as they did for George Bush five, four years ago. They didn't listen to us. Eight million Muslims went and voted for George Bush and ended up with mess on their face. This is part of the strategy of the job to offer you an alternative that this one looks evil, this one good. But there's an expression in Trinidad, I learned it when I was a boy. What is the expression? All same? Huh? Khaki pants, you never hear it? All same khaki pants? Same old khaki pants. You hear it before? Huh? Sisters, you hear it? It's the same thing. Whether you vote for Kerry or whether you vote for George Bush, it makes no difference. It makes no difference. This one is camouflaged to look different. Kerry says that the state of Israel was justified in assassinating Sheikh Ahmad Yassin. Kerry says that the state of Israel was justified in assassinating Ablaziz Rantisi, his successor. Kerry says that the state of Israel is justified in continuing its policy of state-sponsored assassinations of leaders of Hamas. So what difference is there between the two? This side of Magog, this side Gog. All same khaki pants. Hmm? But you're given alternatives. You do not see that they're actually the same. And because you're repulsed by this, you turn and you accept that. It happened time and again on Iraq. France and Germany opposed the war. So France and Germany looked like the good guys. And the United States and Britain like the bad guys. Prior to that, communism and capitalism. This is a free world. The capitalist world, and that is the Marxist communist world. The Marxist communist world is based on socialism, and they want to bring human egalitarianism to the marketplace. For them. So that has the appearance of being better. And so large number of Muslims went and joined the socialist bandwagon, including Muslims in Trinidad who attempted to take over. Trinidad in 1970. And who have now become newspaper colonists. <laughs> Jump onto the socialist bandwagon. Because that appeared to be a different alternative to this one. No! You deceive. Same old khaki pants. Gog and Magog. So that's one of the first reasons why you have two in order that you can utilize this to deceive. <coughs> Second reason, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, by giving us two, provides us with evidence by which we can recognize Gog and Magog. Where there should be only one uniform kind of footprints, you see two. And there is no explanation for this difference in footprints. Hmm? An age which is becoming the age of globalization. All of mankind being embraced in one uniform way of life. The way we dress. Hmm? A hundred years ago, in this room, none of you will be wearing shirt and trousers. None. A hundred years later, all the men, no, with some exceptions, wearing shirt and trousers. Okay? <coughs> Process of 
bringing all of mankind into one uniform way of life. One language, the English language, taking over from all languages. Okay. Nowhere is this uniformity more spectacularly demonstrated than in our technological society. Hmm? Well, then how do you explain the following? <coughs> uh, would it be correct to say that all of mankind today measure temperature centigrade? All of mankind today measure temperature with centigrade, except who? Uncle Sam. Except only one man, only one fella, only one. Uncle Sam. Is it that Uncle Sam does not have the technical capacity to utilize centigrade? Huh? Well then, what possible explanation can there be for one country, the United States of America, stubbornly and obstinately persisting with the use of Fahrenheit when all the rest of mankind has been embracing, embracing one uniform way for the measurement of temperature, the centigrade? There is no answer for that. except that these are the footprints of Gog and Magog. Would it be correct to say that all of mankind today measure weights, metric, and volume, metric? You buy gasoline for your car, you buy it by the liter, hmm? and you measure distance by kilometers? All of mankind except Uncle Sam. Well then why does Uncle Sam persist with miles? So many miles from New York to Toronto. And why does Uncle Sam persist with gallon? When you buy gas for your car, you buy by the gallon. Huh? Is there any a rational explanation. None. None. You cannot explain it. The only explanation is that the footprints of Gog and Magog. <coughs> we buy mangoes by the kilo. But the United States you buy them by the pound. Can we explain it? No. Okay. I ever went and bought a, an electrical appliance and bring it back home. And when you plug it in, whoosh, whole thing burn up. It happened already. But electricity came from that world. The white world order, they gave us electricity. Thomas Edison. Why could they not have one uniform voltage? Is it so difficult for them that they cannot institute one uniform voltage around the world? How come you're still using 110 and them using 220? Is there any rational explanation? None? None? They have the technical competence to bring it into one uniform voltage. We have an engineer sitting here. But they would not do it. It still remains 110 over here and 220 out there. Hmm? The only explanation is the footprints so that the acute observer can see this ought to have been uniform. It is not uniform. There is no rational explanation for this resistance to us, uniformity. And therefore, these are the footprints of Gog and Magog. Have you ever driven a motor car from Britain to France as I did? Yeah. I, I had my car in Dublin, in Ireland. 
I, I went to Dublin to pick up the car. I went, took the ferry, reached to Wales, and I drove across the whole of England, and then I reached to, to Dover. And then I got on the ferry again, and the ferry took me to Calais, Calais, in France. And when I drove off the Kelly now, the, the ferry, I have to drive through France, I have to go to Paris, and then I have to go beyond Paris to reach Geneva. And I want to reach Geneva before night. See, this Molana has some very exciting times in his life, eh? But I driving down the road, and I see this huge, you know, the tractor trailer that carries 20 motor cars on him? I see this fellow coming straight at me. I said, look at that man, he's sleeping. He's driving on the wrong side of the road. A tractor trailer, it's dangerous, eh? No, he's not he driving on the wrong side of the road, it's me. <laughs> it's me. And at the very last moment, when the tractor trailer about to make a sandwich out of him, Ryan was saying, at the last moment I pull aside. Huh? He couldn't pull aside without throwing the, everything down the drain. I said, well, look at that. In Britain, they drive on one side of the road. But in Europe, they drive on the other side of the road. I mean, are these people so devoid of intellectual capacity that they can't change this and you make it uniform? It's dangerous. It, da it ran dangerous. You could kill. You could be killed. Yesterday, yesterday, my wife and I were going up. What was it this morning? To Port of Spain. And right on the Solomon Hotel, I have a, we see a driver going down the road on the wrong side of the road. Cool as a cucumber, he driving on the wrong side of the road. Probably just landed from New York. <coughs> How do you explain? How do you explain this incapacity to bring about a uniformity when that uniformity is essential for safety? But no, it would not come. Britain stands out. Even the United States drives on the uh, right side of the road. Britain, no. Right. And Britain the left. So two countries stand out, Britain and the United States, different from the rest. What does it signify? Answer, here are footprints, footprints of Gog and Magog. Hmm? But it's up to you to choose why you would like to, what, what uh, uh, um, explanation. Now, before we end the destruction of Gog and Magog and we will finish. <coughs> when uh, Nabi Isa alayhi salam comes. The hadith is that he will destroy, he will kill Dajjal. After he kills Dajjal, then comes Gog and Magog, the last wave of Gog and Magog are now released. They pass by the Sea of Galilee to attack Nabi Isa al-Islam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala directs him to Jerusalem. And tells him to go up the mountain, which is a mountain in Jerusalem. And he goes up with the believers up the mountain. And he wipes their faces for them. He gives them words of comfort because the believers are being terrorized. Gog and Magog then lay siege to the mountain. They, and this hadith I can't explain. They then shoot their arrows up into the sky and they say, we have killed those who are on earth. Now let us kill those who are in the heavens above. And Allah allows the arrows to come back down with blood on them. Tomorrow, maybe 30 years from now, there will be a young scholar in Trinidad 
will come forward and explain this hadith inshallah but as of today it's not possible to understand it hmm? we have killed those who are on earth now let us kill those who are in the heavens above so Gog and Magog shoot their arrows up into the sky missiles <coughs> Then Nabi Isa alayhi salam prays to Allah to destroy Gog and Magog. And Allah answers his prayer. And the hadith is that a little insect will attack them at the back of their necks, bite them. And they will all fall down, paralyzed. And by next morning, they'll not only be all dead, but their bodies will begin to rot, to decompose. A medical doctor in South Africa analyzed the hadith and said to me, this implies that it would not be a viral attack, but a bacterial attack. Any doctors here? No doctors? One doctor? Right, mashallah. We have a sister who is a doctor here. <coughs> it will not be a viral attack, he said, but a bacterial attack. Because he said that it is a bacterial attack which will produce this decomposition. Would you agree, sister? You agree with that? Okay. Now then. Our sister, who is a medical doctor, has some homework to do now. What is it that can possibly explain? A very large number of people, all, attacked by a little insignificant insect, the back of the neck, and they all fall down paralyzed, and by next morning they're all dead. A uniform pattern for all of them. What can possibly explain it? It is, of course, a biological warfare. Allah war wages war biologically. Is there any explanation for this? I have suggested that this implies that these people, Gog and Magog, did not have the capacity to fight back. Their bodies had lost the capacity to fight back. The body has been given a system called the immune system with which to be able to resist attacks from outside. And I have suggested that a possible explanation for this would be that the immune system has collapsed. And therefore, we should be monitoring the immune system in the world in which we live today. If our hypothesis is correct, then we will be witnessing a weakening of the immune system. As people begin to live the way of life of Gog and Magog, the immune system grows weaker and weaker. And as the body, <coughs> as the body is no longer strong enough to fight back on its own because the immune system has been weakened, the doctor now has to prescribe something called antibiotics. The evidence, I believe, is already in that around the world there is a uniform phenomenon, the weakening of the immune system around the world. And indeed, I have a brother, a younger brother who is a PhD in medicine and who specializes in microbiology and who has written to me to inform me that there are now people for whom no antibiotics can work. None. They run out of antibiotics. So they are the equivalent of Gog and Magog when they are. What is it can, can explain 
the phenomenon of the weakening of the immune system. Again, my answer is, the immune system gets its sustenance from food, not from Valini's um, pharmacy, from food. Hmm? The genetic composition of food is such that it allows food to not only provide sustenance, nutrition, but also that food may function medicinally. The great engineer engineered the genetic composition food in such a way. When you go and tamper with that genetic composition and modify it so that the crop might increase, yes, farmer making more money now but the food can no longer function medicinally. And so as we corrupt food, as we change its genetic composition, this is one of the possible explanations for the fact that the immune system is growing weaker. But the sister might want to give us some more explanations for the weakening of the immune system. Would you have any comments, sister? Wait, 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 I think I was thinking about is, as you said, which really surprised me, is that it has been proven that they are genetically different. A fly is a thing that will bite me and you. And if it doesn't kill me because I am genetically different from you, it be not so much the immune system, but the genetics, that maybe they their genetics will have them susceptible to the bite of the fly, whereas ours will not. Then. Mashallah, mashallah, mashallah. That's a very perceptive comment system. I didn't think of that. I mentioned to you that, in fact, it was a, a medical doctor in Worcester, in Massachusetts, Dr. Salim who spoke to me on the subject to the west of Boston is a city called Worcester where the biggest hospital system of Massachusetts is located, Worcester. Dr. Salim is there and he's the man who did the research on Ashkenazi Jews and he's the one who pulled out the information from the internet that the Ashkenazi Jew was genetically different from all the rest of mankind. So the sister's observation is very important. She says, perhaps it is not the weakening of the immune system that has caused it, but the fact that they're genetically different from all the rest of mankind. So when Allah attacks them with this little insect, they all fall down and die. This then is uh, the end of our uh, treatment of the subject of Gog and Magog. These are the two Passages of the Quran that you need. وَحَرَامٌ عَلَىٰ قَرْيَةٍ أَهْلَكْنَاهَا أَنَّهُمْ لَا يَرْجِعُونَ حَتَّى إِذَا فُتِحَدْ يَأْجُوجُ وَمَأْجُوجُ وَهُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ حَدَبٍ يَنْسِلُونَ That Allah has placed a ban on a town which he destroyed that the people of that town cannot return to reclaim it as their own until, until Gog and Magog are released and after they're released they spread out in all directions, taking control of the world. And then this is the ayah from Suratul Kaf. That was Suratul Anbiya. In the Juja wa Majuja Musiduna fil Ard, the Choli Gog and Magog inflict facade upon the land, the people, corrupting everything, oppressing everything. Uh, this brings our 
treatment of the subject of Gaga and Magag to a close. So take a look at it. Rabbana taqabbal minna innaka anta samir alim wa tub alayna ya mulana innaka anta tawab rahim. Bi rahmatika ya arhamar rahmina.